Hey, this is John Southhurst for BitsOnline.com. And today we're talking to Halsey Miner of VideoCoin. Now, I think Halsey Miner's name is going to sound very familiar to anyone who was around in the 1990s like I was. Uh, he was the founder of online media giant CNET, which is something you may have heard of. And he was also a founder and major investor in Salesforce.com and uh, Rhapsody. I think that's right. So in 2014, he entered the crypto space with a company called BitReserve, which was um, one of the probably one of the earliest attempts at kind of a Bitcoin bank or payments platform, like similar to PayPal. It's uh, it's since rebranded as Uphold, and I think you're you're still CEO of Uphold. Is that correct? No, <clears throat> no, it's a uh, it's a direct competitor to uh, to uh, Coinbase. Oh, okay. Um, it's uh, one of the very few. Uh, platforms on the planet that allows you to, to directly connect your U.S. and EU um, uh, bank. Uh, so uh, everyone in the United States and Europe and in other places around the world can connect their bank account directly and uphold. So it's now a, it's now uh, it's not as big as Coinbase, but it's a large, very profitable company because the problem that I set out to solve actually in 2013 was how do you get your money into the system to buy uh, to buy these cryptocurrencies? And so it took me about two and a half years. Ultimately, we had to buy a bank uh, in order to do that. Um, you had to buy I, a bank. Yeah, well, we had to buy a large part of a bank. Yeah, Coinbase got very lucky with their deal with Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, <clears throat> so no, it was it's uh, no, it's pretty much a dead. It's actually a better product than Coinbase. It's just that Coinbase started uh, beforehand, and they haven't really marketed themselves. Uh, I stepped down about two and a half years ago, uh, so I ran it from 2013 to the middle of 2015. Um, to uh, let me just turn my phone off here. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I got involved in the industry around 2012, and I launched uh, I launched BitReserve. BitReserve has changed to uphold. Because no bank would bank us if we had bit in our name. And there are a lot of hard things to do, accomplish in crypto. None is harder than trying to connect crypto to the U.S. banking system. I'll say this again. None is harder than connecting crypto to the U.S. banking system. Oh, and I, I, had to, I had to hire the head of security and, uh, and regulatory from uh, MasterCard to come in. I mean, it was a... It was a real, you know, many year uh, effort. And um, but the result is it's now one of the few places where it's very easy. Connect your U.S. bank account, bring money in, buy Bitcoin and and other currencies. Right, right. And is, is uh, Uphold available in many countries or just the U.S.? Uh, I think they have. Um, I, I think they have users, users from over 200 countries. Oh, OK. And I'm, not, uses... I'm, not, I'm not actually I'm not actually. Uh, an executive anymore right. but um but yeah i mean it's a very global business right right well anyway that that's uh that's uphold.com if anyone's interested in finding out more about that's that correct. yeah so um, i'm actually interested in talking to you about your new project today which is video coin um, right did did that grow out of the uh live planet project at all yeah i mean just a just kind of a brief background <clears throat> so I, I started seeing that in the 90s but i also built the the internet's leading web publishing platform that was my internal platform i spun it out that became an 11 billion dollar enterprise software company i left uh and um helped first john dillon the first ceo of salesforce and then later uh mark benioff build that and then i started a couple of other platforms i started uh what's now called google voice which is a voice platform uh, and the largest DNS provider in the world called Open DNS, which is about a quarter of, uh, well, sorry, about four or five percent of all D DNS. Um, so when I got interested in, in crypto, the the problem that seemed ubiquitous and you know interesting to try to solve was how do people get their money uh, from their bank accounts into this new world? And um, so I spent about two and a half years working on that. It's a lot of regulatory stuff that was in, were involved in it. I found another person I thought more appropriate at the time to be, uh, you know, involved in a highly regulated business. And so I launched another platform, which is a VR video platform. Uh, it's a camera cloud software at the end. So it's an end to end platform and spent two and a half years building that. So I like building platforms. Um, and um, we uh, the, it's called Live Planet. And the idea is that we want 
you know, to be able to essentially allow people to be anywhere around the planet live with VR, which kind of gives you the sense of of, of immersion and, and being places. Um, and just as at CNET, I had to solve a very fundamental problem around, which is how do I do web publishing? I had to solve a very fundamental problem, which was how do I take this video and process it and get it onto all these other platforms? And the biggest problem we ran into is cost. So if I were to take my VR camera, connect it to the internet, run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would cost $30,000 a month to run that one camera because it's 4K. Mm, so it ouch. became very clear that as we get to 4K and VR and AR and all these new uh, you know, technologies, video is already is already 80% of the internet. It's growing at 25% compound annual. It is itself at uh, the knee of a curve because video is about to go from being something we watch to something we live in, right? So we have this this extraordinary thing that's happening in video itself. And, and that's what, that is part of what's creating this massive um, uh, uptick in, in video. In 10 years, if 95% of the internet's not video, I'd be, I would be uh, shocked. Um, yeah, and I agree. So, so it's created, so it's, it's, it's really kind of transformed the internet. It's transformed communication. It's why you've done print and now you're doing me in, in video today and you apply that to basically everybody across the internet. What, is, what that's done is created an extraordinary um, problem, particularly for large media companies. They've been used to doing broadcasts, which cost them nothing. They bounce it off the satellite. Um, and now they're having these one-to-one -one, um, streams, which every new person that comes on costs them more money. And they don't know how to monetize it. So what's happened is that, you know, for instance, uh, our advisor, Hanno Vasse, who's the, the CTO of 20th Century Fox, you know, they're they're now taking content, streaming it over the Internet. They're having to pay for it, but they're having a very difficult time monetizing it. So so they're not getting new money, but they have all this new this new cost. And and this has created a, a significant issue because not only are they paying this money and not monetizing it, they're paying it to Amazon. And, and it's doubly pro problematic because Amazon is their competitor. And it's triply problematic because Amazon's most profitable business is Amazon Web Services. And it's quadruply a problem because Amazon Web Services is the business they're using to go in and basically drive all other businesses out of business. So they're doing it in retail. They're doing it in media. So if you look at Amazon Web Services, it is the beating heart of Amazon that is used to basically come in and wipe all these competitors off of uh, off of the uh, face of of planet Earth, kind of like what's going on in the Amazon rainforest. That basically it's all being timbered. <laughs> That's uh, ironically appropriate there. Well, I'm uh, I'm all in favor of uh, companies like Amazon and Facebook and Google not becoming the entire internet by themselves. Well, so am I. Mm. But I think you know I think what's happening is there's something very profound happening which is companies like Amazon, which are really driven around the centralization of resources. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, are, you know, are not very resource friendly. I mean, when I get all these boxes from Amazon, it's my fault. I order from them. You know, it's a huge amount of waste that we're, you know, that we're creating. And I think we're moving into much more of a decentralized kind of world. Not, not only um, but for some very good reasons, like, you know, I mean, ultimately I think, well, most people believe that our power will come from our roofs, right? And we, we, we will, the whole grid will become decentralized. Um, and so there are a lot of systems that are, that are actually work better when they're on a, a, a decentralized basis. Our, our cells, each, one, if our, each of our cells is perfectly capable of, of, uh, of, of operating, um, powering itself. Um, so, so I think we're, we're moving from this age of, of, vast centralization um, where that was the most efficient way to this decentralized model. And in our case, we create radical efficiencies by not centralizing it, which is a really big step. And only the blockchain has really been the enabler of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hope it can actually scale to the point where it does that um, efficiently. So, video coin is that a front end as well as a back end, or are you just doing the uh, the infrastructure behind everything? 
Yeah, we're really an infrastructure company. So we're a dead on competitor to AWS. So so the di the difference is so so my CTO built Intel's video streaming cloud just just like uh, Amazon. In fact, it was a competitor to Amazon. In fact, that's part of the reason I think why they sold it to Facebook. So for everybody who saw Facebook show up one day in their in um, uh, in the app, it was really because they bought it. In, they bought uh, Intel's uh, video cloud business, um, and so. Um, He's probably the only person who uh, has actually probably built a uh, video cloud in, in, in 10 years. The thing that's most interesting about, um, about what we're doing and what's going on in general is when more people buy Bitcoin, nobody goes and asks more miners to mine. They just appear. It's, it's this bizarre build it and they will come kind of thing, right? So what we found is that in digital, in the world of digital currency, is that whenever there's more demand, there are those people willing to put more resources on the network to soak up that, that demand and, uh, and to do it in a very efficient manner. Yeah, and of course the Bitcoin miners are earning money for it. Uh, that's probably yes. the main incentive. Yes, and as, as will the video coin uh, miners. And right. so what we do is we take, so, so just that for starters, 20% of all um, servers and data centers today are zombies. They're not used for anything. They're not used for overflow, straight up overbuilding. So every one of those servers could tomorrow run our software and be able to generate um, video coin just like the miners for uh, 300,000, for 3,000 other currencies generate whatever currency they get paid. The, the difference is that our miners do useful work. They're actually doing encoding, storage, and streaming. They're not doing the kind of work that say Bitcoin miners do, which is, you know, kind of this arbitrary work that's kind of part of the whole um, mining infrastructure. They do, very, they do very valuable work. And so we're turning these, these resources, just like Airbnb is done with, uh, with homes and, and Uber is done with cars. We're turning all these, these, these resources that are underutilized all around the world um, into a productive network and completely commoditizing computation as we know it this is the new cloud right i'm actually quite curious as to how this all works technically will your uh, will your miners actually be storing files at all or will they be managing the network of storage or distributed so storage? There'll be, there'll be, so there'll be four four things they do there'll be encoding people don't don't necessarily understand this but but video requires a massive amount of processing for every device you have has multiple files at multiple bandwidths, and every device has its own file. So you're talking about enormous numbers of, of video that needs to get processed into all these different forms. It's called encoding. Um, then you've got storage. It's less of a problem. Encoding is probably the most difficult uh, and most expensive. And then you've got streaming, which is effectively bandwidth. We have a fourth um, set of miners. Uh, they're called relay miners. And what they do is they connect from our network into your existing AWS or Google network so that all of your existing infrastructure can be brought into, uh, into the video coin network. So we, we totally embrace what you have and then we extend it with uh, all of these, these services that are, that are the same. Uh, I would say over, over time, they're probably gonna be more innovative, uh, but dramatically lower cost. So we have a clear path for people to take what they have. They don't have to, they don't have to shut down what they're doing and they can just begin to migrate their their uh, their new um, uh, their new content onto our network. Okay, and how much of the technology behind all this actually exists now, and how much do you need to develop? Yeah, so the, the example I give is we're just like um, we're just like uh, Salesforce.com. When Salesforce.com first started, we had a CRM application. That's what you're selling. And then over time, we turned it into a, a, a general purpose platform that allowed people to build any kind of software. So we have the first application, which is a VR app, which takes 4K video and it transcodes it to, you know, Facebook and YouTube and, and Samsung and, uh, and um, Facebook and I think they've said Facebook, uh, Oculus Rift and et cetera. So we've had to build all of this uh, massive encoding in the in the cloud around a very specific app, and now we're generalizing it so that so that what we do 
ourselves can be a more generalized service that everybody else can uh, can take on. So, so apart from the coin part, a lot of the encoding, storage, and streaming stuff already has been put in place. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, I think people underestimate how difficult it is to build these coin architectures. You know, they, they think they get an ERC-20 you know, and everything will be fine. These things are very complicated to, de to develop. And we have a pretty significant engineering challenge to really make this work at scale instantaneously. Um, and, you know, I think the difference maybe between us and a lot of people is we know it's hard. Um, and, um, you know, but we have an incredibly talented team of, of engineers and we're, we're adding to them every day. Yeah, I think in this space, it's better to trust someone who's even been around for uh, six years better than someone who came in last year and only knows Ethereum. Yeah, I mean, I exactly. I mean, and, and I, I'm not, you know, Ethereum is sort of the idea today. But I mean, Ethereum is just a it's a small part of what we think we have to use to build. You know, I mean, I, I compare it to like search engines during the 90s, you know. There was Lycos and Alta Vista, and then there was Yahoo, and then there was, you know, they kept going. And they, like the 15th search engine was Google. And that's when, you know, and I think we're going to see the same kind of thing with uh, with these coins like, um, like Ethereum. I just think there's, you know, as people understand the use cases better, these more general purpose platforms will get better. Um, but I think right now, I don't think Ethereum comes close to scaling for the kind of things that we want to do. And that just means there's a lot of, uh, of really kind of hardcore development. But I mean, you know, I just spent two and a half years building an end-to-end -end VR platform with hardware, cloud, and apps. So, you know, I, I'm not afraid to take on, um, you know, a difficult, um, in fact, I, I've never been afraid to take on difficult uh, engineering challenges. In fact, it, it's, uh, it's kind of what drives me. That's for certain, yeah. So um, I want to move on to the the token aspect of this now. You you're going to have a token called Video Coin, is that right? It's the name of the platform and the token. That's yeah, it's a Video Coin network, and yeah, it's called Video Coin. That's okay, correct. Cool. And it will run on its own independent blockchain. It will. Okay, that's correct. And uh, native blockchain. You're you're going to raise funds for this by doing uh, an ICO, which is that's uh, correct. Which is the way things are done now. You you actually pioneered that in a way because you did a crowdfund for a Bit Reserve a few years ago, right? I, I did a bit a bit did a crowdfund for Bit Reserve, and I also had a company that I invested in um, called the Voxel that did a that did a that I see a way back in in uh, in 2015. So I watched those guys, uh, you know, go through their uh, their process. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I've been I've kind of seen this industry from every point of view. You know, having started really in 2012, um, and I've seen it mature but yeah i mean it's gone from i think when the voxel went out and raised you know they got five hundred thousand dollars and you know after that somebody got six million and that was a big deal wow. um you know obviously it's uh it's very different today but yeah so so we're raising um 50 million um we're pretty close to i mean we're probably done if we depending upon how we want to do this um we have um, I, most, if not all, of the big global, the best names in um, uh, in crypto investing will be announcing them relatively shortly. Um, we're really right now trying to decide whether we want to have a, a, a public component to our sale. Um, oh, okay. We we don't need to, um, but it's more of a philosophical um, conversation that we're having. Right, uh, around right. it is the is the token you're using in the ICO going to be the same token you use on the platform that's the uh, the video coin token or is it something different the token that we that will initially be offered will work on on our platform so it will work on the live planet platform um, when we create a more generalized platform that that everyone can use and 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 build on top of just probably a year after the uh the ico um, we will we will swap out the token the initial token that we provide and we'll provide the the new token that we've built uh, because we have an existing service today um we're we're a true utility token uh, we can actually issue the token people can actually use it uh for an application 
Um, ultimately, it'll be one of many applications that runs on the network. Um, so, so we'll issue a token uh, very shortly after the ICO and, and hopefully be trading relatively quickly after the ICO as well. Okay, good. And uh, I, I was going to ask you more about uh, the team you've assembled there. I think a lot of people are going to trust you to build this more than just about anyone else. But um, you, uh, you mentioned briefly before that you had some pretty high-powered people with, uh, <laughs> with lots of experience in this field working for you. Who have you, who have you got there? Yeah, no, it's kind of, you know, I, of course, have a lot of experience both in the industry and, and building other companies. And uh, my CTO built um, Intel's um, video streaming cloud. Um, and then he went to Cloudera, where he architected um, these um, uh, very um, large scale distributed systems. Um, and then a lot of the engineers we have are all um, we have some of the top video engineers in the world, a number of them also came from, a number of them also came from, uh, from Intel as well. And we have a, we have a great advisory board. Um, the CTO of 20th Century Fox um, is, uh, is one of our advisors. Um, he's a super helpful advisor, brilliant guy, Hanno Basse. Um, and Ted Chilowitz, who's uh, the head of, of innovation at uh, Paramount, who reports to the, to the CEO. Um, and a couple of other people who are really well known um, in the, and very well respected in the in the media industry. Um, and um, Seth um, is Seth Shapiro is not only uh, incredibly well respected in it's kind of a, it's kind of a very odd set of skills now. He's um, if you read his bio, he's probably nobody in media that he hasn't uh, at some point consulted for about you know, new technologies, but he also happened to get very interested in crypto about a year and a half ago. So he, he knows that space as, uh, he knows that space as, as, as well. Um, you know, I think we have a bunch of people who are, you know, really serious developers who have experience, um, um, in are already in, in doing blockchain oriented uh, projects that we'll, we'll bring in. I think we still need probably to hire another 10 to 12 engineers um, to, to do this. So we're, we're by no means done. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're, I mean, if you look at my background, I mean, um, uh, you know, when I left CNET, we were a NASDAQ 100 company. Um, and that was during the bubble. And I left to, to uh, help Mark start Salesforce, which is a Fortune 500 company. Um, and the first company I started in this industry is uh, profitable. Um, and successful and, and growing very quickly. So, yeah, I mean, our, we're, we're not in a position where we can just go run off uh, and, uh, and nobody hears from us again. I mean, we're all, um, we're all very well respected in our, in our respective areas and um, have a long history of, of delivering complex systems that are disruptive. And, um, you know, we, we take this as seriously as anything else we've ever done before. In fact, we actually think the opportunity is is uh is extraordinary i i i can say this because i was actually around for the for the first internet yeah I, in many ways this is is to me as important as the original internet it's like the way i look at it the original internet was just all about information mm -hmm. now with the blockchain you can you can exchange information and value you know at the same time which is really you know a very revolutionary idea yeah um, sure just um one thing we ask everything, everyone who's in the, the distributed storage space, and especially content delivery as well, what are you going to do about uh, things like uh, illegal content or uh, censorship? Uh, is that, are those issues you're going to address? You, is there going to be any moderation at all, or is it going to be completely, uh, completely decentralized in that anyone can put up anything they like? You know, I wish I could tell you that we had a magic bullet for this, but I have to put nobody has a, has a magic bullet for this. That's a hard problem. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those problems. It's it, it's it's uh, you know, it's uh, it's not intractable, but you can build. You know, we can build ways of compensating people for finding. I mean, there really are, are there's really illegal content. Um, that's a bit of a problem. Like, there's some content that's sort of universally illegal, like you know, child pornography, for instance. Um, then there's other content that's illegal because of the state. 
You know, it's like, you know, some some nation states don't like content because it doesn't fit their ideological point of view. So, like, how do you protect that? Because obviously that's a big part of, you know, uh, of being able to build something that's decentralized. And then there's the uh, the theft of copyrights. And, um, you know, you need to be able to identify those. And we have some ways that we're uh, that we're thinking about doing it. My guess is we'll probably employ multiple ways. Um, you know, having a compensation model where people are rewarded for for finding uh, content um, and creating some kind of uh, community mechanism for removing it. Um, but it's not a problem that AWS or anybody is completely solved. Um, you know, everybody, even Google, uh, you know, is constantly trying to figure out better ways to uh, to manage the uh, the content that's that's being put up publicly at um, um, at um, um, at YouTube, not to mention all the co- the content that we don't see uh, that's being um, that's being served up as part of their cloud service. Right, so, yeah. to give you a really specific answer, I think it's going to take uh, a couple of different approaches, possibly many different approaches, all working to address the problem. But what we do want to do, though, is we you know, we do see a significant value in being able to um, provide for content, which is not morally wrong, but might be philosophically wrong for, um, you know, uh, based on geography. Right. Um, right. So sometimes when you do these new companies, you have to have almost a philosophical bearing. You know, this whole thing started out with a lot of philosophy. You know, Bitcoin started really from a philosophical basis. Uh, it was almost too philosophical for its own good. Um, and um, it's kind of softened that, but, but it's always started out with a set of, a set of global goals, uh, with decentralization and, and privacy being, being one of those, those core attributes that, um, that everything should strive for. Yeah, and those of us who were around in the 1990s remember going through all of this the first time around as well. That's right. Yeah. That's right. All yeah, right. There were a lot, um, of, lot of fights back then. <laughs> and they will continue, I'm sure. And they will continue, yeah. So uh, I think we're almost out of time here, but I just want to get an idea of the uh, the roadmap in the immediate future. Um, when are you going to announce the investors, and uh, what's going to happen with the ICO? I think in the next week or so, we should announce the... Um, the institutional investors that have come in. And I think within the next uh, two weeks, we're scheduled, I think, for a public ICO around uh, late March, like around March 22nd or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're going to have to decide in the next couple of weeks what, we, um, what we're going to do. Um, I, I can tell you from a philosophical standpoint, we'd like to do um, a public ICO. I think what everybody's weighing today is just the risk-reward on, on doing it, right. um, you do you do increase your risk um, by having a public ICO. Um, you know, I've been I've been very frustrated by the U.S. government and by their you know unwillingness to 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 be clear uh, about you know the good thing about the government is um, it was it was up in the air for a long time, but ultimately they were clear that they were not going to uh, collect sales tax on the internet. I don't know if you remember this, but it was a really important oh, thing. Yeah, this is why Amazon is so successful for so long. They didn't have to collect sales tax. And, and you know, states and, and municipalities were screaming, you know, and there are people who wanted to put, you know, the guys from Amazon in jail for not, uh, you know, for not collecting tax. But ultimately, the, the government said, you know what, we're going to um, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to we're going to make it so that that everybody knows you don't have to collect sales tax, which is a big burden. And then we have things like net neutrality. We said, okay, the, 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 we're going to, you know, maintain an open, an open internet, and and that was could allow for planning. We haven't had, we haven't had the same thing here, um, and you know, it's always better for governments early on to be light-handed rather than heavy-handed, um, and um, hopefully they'll be light-handed. No-handed is not good. Heavy-handed is not good. You know, light-handed gives people a sense of understanding of what the rules are um, and and a modicum of, of, of regulation on top of that. So, you know, 
I, we, we, for instance, have set up a Cayman operation. Um, same thing for, uh, for Uphold was a Cayman operation. And it'd be nice if these businesses could come back to the United States, um, where all of my businesses prior, large businesses, some of them huge businesses, were all built. Right, right. All right, then. So um, where can people go to just to keep track of all of this? Uh, videocoin.io. Videocoin.io. Yeah. Okay, then. All right. I look forward to seeing what comes next out of this. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, that's, uh, this is John Southurst for bitsonline.com talking to Halsey Miner. Halsey, very grateful for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.